Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Collison from Inspired Creations Surrey School of Shuttlecraft. So this tutorial is all about how to ice, so how to prepare and ice a sponge cake and cover it with sugar paste. I'm just going to share the kit list with you, so if you would like to work alongside then you can do so. And if you have any questions, simply get in touch with us. My website address is inspiredcreations.uk.com. So here we go. This is what we're going to do. We're going to cover a sponge cake and put a ribbon onto it today. Excellent. So um, sponge cake covering, uh, there is actually quite a lot of sponge cake covering and this is the basics. And the idea by the end of the lesson is for you to have iced your cake um, on your board with a little bow to finish if you've got some ribbon, all right? So the first thing we're gonna do, and if you want to, if you are working alongside, you can, if you want, do this with me. Um, because these are kind of short, short little explanations. I've got the tin that I baked the cake in. The cake itself has been baked and frozen in, okay? You don't need to freeze your cake in, but it's nice to know that you can. And um, all I did was the cake was baked, we let it cool, we popped it in a freezer bag, labeled it up with the date that we're freezing it in, and uh, then it gets, it gets popped in the freezer with nothing around it so that you don't create any dinks. When I have baked the cake, um, I have actually lined the tin. So I've put a strip of grease with paper around the outside edge and I've lined the inside bit as well. Okay. And when the cake comes out, the lining paper that's around the side of the cake is left on as it cools. But before I freeze it, I take the greaseproof paper strip off of the cake. And that's because sometimes it can create kinks and dinks um, as you kind of put it into the bag. If the paper's up a little bit, it can squidge and mark the cake. So I prefer not to have the side strip. But I do keep the bottom strip on. And the reason for that is because when you place the cake into the bag and then subsequently freeze and defrost it, sometimes the cake can actually stick to the plastic. And then of course you've lost some of your cake. And the bottom side of the cake is the side we're gonna use as our top. So we want to keep that as preserved as possible, as flat as possible, okay? So um, the tin is used to help us level. And what I would do is drop the cake into the tin, but if it's recessed, so if it falls in too far for me not to be able to trim the peak, then I can put drinks mats or cake cards in the bottom. So I've just got some cake cards here, but at home you've probably more likely got drinks mats. Okay, so try one or two, depending on how peaked your cake is and how deep your cake tin is. If your cake's dropped in lower, then you need to raise the cake so you've got it to the point where you can actually start to trim. And cake, because you've got two cakes, I know that you're going to have a big dome that you're going to trim off. I'm sure that you can, your family will uh, enjoy the off cuts as much as the actual cake. Um, but today, so your cake's not too deep because deep cakes are harder to ice, um, I would trim it to where it starts to dome. Okay, so you just take the whole dome off so you end up with a dead flat uh, surface. So I'm gonna use just a bread knife to cut across. And I'm using, I'm using the tin as my guide. So this is pressed down nice and firm against the tin. It could scratch the tin, but it's only the top edge. It's not gonna um, affect any subsequent baking that you do. Okay, so nice and flush against the surface of the tin edge and that will um, give you a straight cut. Now my excess I'm just going to pop into this bag okay because my birds my birds eat this. Um, if you've got a super peaked cake and you don't want to trim the whole dome off because you want to keep the height of the cake then you can make a filler which I'll talk you through in a moment all right and I'll explain why you would need a filler in a moment as well. 
So once I've done one cut, I need to turn the tin around a little bit and just make doubly sure that I have actually trimmed this straight. Otherwise, you could find, especially if you've got your angle, the angle of your knife um, not flat, that you've got kind of a scoop out in the middle and that it's not dead flat. So this is kind of your one chance really to get it nice and level. Much easier to do it in the tin than by eye. Okay, so the next step after that is to take some of your buttercream and we need to attach a board um, to the, this cut piece of cake. Now this is going to become the bottom. Okay, it was the top, it's going to become the bottom. My buttercream through this whole process needs to be soft enough to comfortably get a knife through. Okay, if this is any way set, we need to warm it just slightly in the microwave on defrost just for a few seconds at a time. Um, so little and often so that you don't actually melt it, but it wants to feel nice and spreadable. I'm just going to take a little bit of that buttercream onto my knife and then I'm going to spread that into the middle. Okay. And once you've got that fairly, it's, you know, it's, there's a bit of texture to it, but it's not a thick amount. So I turn that upside down and pop it onto the cake and flip the cake over with the tin still on. Have a look over the cake and make sure you've got the same amount of distance all the way around the board. Then you know the cake's centralised and you can remove the tin. Now just a quick mention on the tin as well, you don't need to have one that's got a separate base. The most important thing for a cake tin is that you've got a 90 degree angle in the corner on the edge here. If you've got one of those spring form tins and it's got a little beaded edge inside, that's going to transfer onto what you want as your top of your cake. So though the spring form tins, if they've got a ridge that you can't turn upside down and hide, then you maybe need to look at investing it in some different tins. These are just stainless steel. They don't have to be thick because you can insulate your cake with your lining with the greaseproof paper. So these were my drinks mats or boards. And now I can remove my paper. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a couple more things and then I'm going to get you to have a go. All right, if you're not already working alongside, it's fine if you are. So we need to split the cake. It's not very easy with a knife to make a level split. So often when you take the lid off, you wouldn't necessarily know which way the top half of the cake goes back on to the bottom half. So I score the side of my cake vertically. So you take a little small wedge, but something that's not going to close up again when you handle it, of cake out of the side of your cake. And now I can cut through and it doesn't matter if I cut it at a silly angle. So just position, just hold on to your knife and position it about halfway on the cake and then you slice through. Okay, so just a sawing action all the way through. As you come towards the end, just slow the cutting down so that you don't flick through and possibly tear the cake. And also be mindful that if your hands are in the way, you don't want to cut yourself. So now I can take that piece off of there. And even though that is slightly at an angle, it doesn't matter because when I've filled it with some buttercream, I know which way it's going to go. Okay, so I'm just going to get you to do that bit for me or finish it. And when you're done on that bit, just give me a thumbs up and we can move straight on. So we're going to fill it and crumb coat it. And then once we've done that, you're going to put yours to the fridge. Now this bit, you may or may not want to um, work alongside. Um, probably best to just watch a little bit and then and then start. Um, you will have time after the demo. So again, spreadable buttercream, that's really important. Uh, but I never add water or milk and I never add icing sugar to um, firm it up. I always just use heat and fridge, so hot and cold to adjust it because the, the recipe is right for what you need, which is a buttercream that firms up, that stiffens, okay? 
And today we're only going to put a thin layer in the center. The reason for that is because we have only got a limited amount of time in the fridge. And if you want to put a really thick layer of buttercream into that cake, then you need to make sure that that layer, that layer of filling is fully, fully set before you actually go ahead and try and ice your cake. Otherwise, the pressure, the movement, just even however slight and feather light the movement is, you're going to make that buttercream ooze out of the side of the cake. And possibly if you have sugar paste coated a cake before, you might have noticed after a few hours that you get this ripple down the side of your cake, down the vertical side. And that is a result of the contents in the filling has not set. OK, so today you're just going to do a very thin layer. So I've just dropped um, you know, a decent scoop with the palette knife onto my cake. And now with my blade quite flat on the surface, just turning it. So it's this movement here like this without lifting because if you lift you pull crumbs and buttercream off so the idea is to plant the knife and then spread backwards and forwards and start to ease that buttercream evenly all the way around the surface of the cut cake without lifting your knife if you lift the knife you get crumbs okay and that's how you can end up a bit messy especially if you're scooping and lifting and scooping and lifting that's going to cause you just to have lots of crumbs crumbs are okay they're all part of the cake and they're still very edible um, but if you're trying to minimize them then the answer is to keep your knife on the surface okay so we're just going to go all the way to the edge when you want to come off if you get the knife to the point where you've only got just one part lift touching the cake and then lift away it should come off cleanly or um, you might only have just a little area that exposes cake all right so just the very small edge of the knife and then you come away so that's how you fill the center again just nice and thin today just so that you get a good finish so i've got my line that i made i'm just going to locate the other line and those two lines come together how they were before we cut our cake and just make sure that you haven't got a step here you need to make sure that that is on exactly how it needs to be and because you've put it back the right way you've got a level cake still which is a plus okay then I'm going to take some more buttercream I'm going to start on the top now when you crumb coat for whatever you're doing the crumb coating is only a very very thin layer we don't want a thick layer because all you're trying to do is set the crumbs. So sugar paste coating that we're doing today, if you put a thick coat of buttercream on here now, even though we could potentially set it by leaving it in the fridge for a couple of hours, we still have the problem when it comes back to room temperature of this being so thick that it's gonna move around underneath the sugar paste. So when you sugar paste coat a cake, you always crumb coat thinly. It's, it's called a crumb coat because what it's supposed to do is just set the crumbs. That's all it's doing, setting the crumbs. Okay, it's not about adding flavour to the cake. Now, um, if you're just doing a plain buttercream coated cake, which are very popular at the moment, you would still crumb coat it in the same way as I'm showing you now, nice and thinly. And then once it's set, this layer is set, you can then go ahead and add a thicker layer of buttercream over the top. And because your bottom crumb coat layer is thin, when you come to scrape the thicker layer or add and, add and scrape the thicker layer of buttercream, this is if you're not putting sugar paste on, then you will find that as you scrape, you won't pull crumbs through. If this layer is thick and you add more buttercream onto this for scraping just to have a pure buttercream finish, then you will find that the crumbs will pull through. Okay, so that's the trick. Um, the same as well when you want a naked cake that's got just a bit of buttercream on it like this has now, um, you would still crumb coat like this. You add your extra buttercream on and then you scrape almost back to this layer but not through this layer. And again, it gives you a clean finish. I can explain that some more if, um, if that was uh, a bit too much to for me to explain just now. So I've just gone, I'm not worried about being over the edge 
because I'm going to be adding um, to the side of my cake. I want to make sure that my buttercream is soft enough. So each time I'm just taking a scoop of buttercream and popping it onto the side and making that, uh, it probably each scoop will do at least a quarter of the cake because you only want it thin, okay? And we will neaten this up in a moment. Now, if when you've trimmed the peak off your cake, you have got a gap under here because you've only taken a bit of the peak off because you don't want to lose the height of your cake, if that gap is really significant, then you need to fill it with more than just buttercream. So what you would do is take the crumbs or the off cut, crumble that into a small bowl with a little bit of your buttercream, combine it so you get something that's a bit like paste, and then you would take that crumb filler and scoop that into the bottom gap if it's large. If it's only small, then it doesn't matter. You can fill it with buttercream. And that would mean that when you serve your slices up, then you are giving someone a mixture of buttercream and cake instead of a thick wedge of buttercream. And it also helps when you cover a cake to have something more firm, a filler that's more firm in that gap. So that's if you have not trimmed your entire peak. You'll notice as well that I'm working in a small pot. The reason for that is so that I don't contaminate my full batch of buttercream with crumbs. I'd rather just work with a small pot and add to that. And then that way I know I can use my buttercream for piping or something else I might be working on or the outer layer if you're just buttercream coating rather than sugar paste coating. Um, buttercream can also be frozen in. So you will have some buttercream left after this and um, whatever you've got left, if you think you're not going to use it straight away, then you can go ahead and freeze it down. The only one that doesn't freeze is uh, buttercream that's been made with chocolate that's melted um, because it comes back bitty, comes back with a texture. So you're better off um, using cocoa powder if you want to make buttercream that you're going to freeze. So I'm just going to um, just show you this uh, technique with the knife. It's important that your knife is upright. If your knife is leaning more, so if you're pressing more on the bottom or if you're pressing more on the top, then what you'll find is you'll be taking more buttercream off the bottom or top. For example, if my knife is at this angle, I'm going to be cutting through the top of this edge, which is no good. So make sure that your knife is completely flat onto the surface, nice and vertical. And then you turn the knife like you did on the top and spread side to side like this. It's quite interesting when you start to look at how you hold a tool and you realize that you might be top or bottom heavy with your pressure, but it makes a difference. And you'll notice here, as I don't need the buttercream, I'm actually scooping it back into my pot. So we go all the way around the sides. And I just want to talk to you about how to fix this top edge because that's the one thing that most people struggle with. Um, and you don't have to be 100% neat with this at this stage. You just need to get it to the right thickness because once it's come out of the fridge, we're gonna use a hot knife to smooth it. Okay. Um, so in a little while, I'm gonna be asking you to pop your kettle on and get yourself a hot cup of water, but we'll do that later. So here I've got some cake showing. I've got some extra buttercream. I'm gonna put that on from the top, spread it so it oozes over the side, and then go back to flat spreading on the side. Okay, that's how you get the top edge covered if you're struggling. If you find your cake is so silly crumbly, then what you can do is do your best with the buttercream at this stage and then pop it to the fridge. And when it comes back out of the fridge, if you need to, you can hot knife it and then you can actually put more buttercream on in the areas that you're not happy with. And you can do that as many times as you like. So especially with a very fresh cake um, or if you've had to trim it because the outside edge is a little bit crusty, 
um, you could find that it's initially very unmanageable. So you can do it in a few stages. Now, if you notice, I've got all these lumps and bumps now. Okay, these I need to um, clean up. So I'm just going to clean off my knife. One second. You've got, I've got some judder on my um, camera and I don't know why. I'll fix that in a moment. Um, these lumpy bumps need to come off. So if you clean off the back of your knife and hold your knife at an angle onto those ridges and just draw into the center, okay? Each time cleaning off your knife so that any excess doesn't go back onto the cake. If I have a dirty knife, it's gonna add more um, buttercream onto the side. So just lay the knife onto the ridge and just draw it in. Effectively, what you're trying to do is get a 90 degree angle, a neat angle. Okay, so I've got a really big one here. So place the knife so it's touching the surface of the bit you want to come off and scrape. If you're not sure how far to press down, then just do it bit by bit. Okay, and I just feel like I need to neaten this side here just a little bit more. And then I'm gonna come back and just re-clean that up, okay? So you don't need it any neater than that at this stage. All I've got to do now is just use a piece of kitchen towel just to clean off the board. And then I can put some cling film on there and that can go to the fridge. So I'm gonna give you some time to have a go at that now. So feel free to unmute and ask, for it, ask me for any questions. So once your cake has been in the fridge for at least 20 minutes, which will be the case, we need to hot knife it. Now, when it comes out the fridge, I mean, even though this has only been in there for about five minutes or so, it's not fully set, but it's dry, okay? It's not coming off on my hands. So if you've got a dry surface, when you try and ice it with the sugar paste, it doesn't know what to stick to. So we have to hot knife this for two reasons, to smooth it and to make it tacky. And when we're smoothing over with the hot knives, we want to make sure that we cover every single part of that cake so that all of it is tacky. Otherwise you'll get to the point where you've iced your cake and you'll think, well, why is it not sticking? And it will be because the sugar paste doesn't know to stick on that part because it's not sticky. And that's how you end up with an air bubble between your sugar paste layer and your buttercream, okay? So it's really important to be a bit systematic when it comes to warming the cake with a knife. So what I've got here is just my two palette knives. You can work with one, but the reason I've got two is so that I can dry one and use it while the other one's heating. But to be honest, they're quite quick to uh, warm up anyway, okay? So this is boiled water, it's so hot that when I pull this knife out, I won't be able to touch my uh, hand with it. Okay, so pull that out. Important, you've got to dry it because we don't want wet on our surface. All we're trying to do is smooth and make it tacky. So at this point, you're not actually scraping any more buttercream off. You're pressing it a little bit onto the cake, whoops, and making it tacky. Now, I don't need to do a huge amount on here other than get it slightly tacky because this has not been in the fridge for long enough, okay? If you've had your cake in there for a couple of hours, what you might find is that the difference in temperature between cold and room, you could well find that it will get beads of sweat on it anyway. So that's going to help you. One thing you don't want to do is bake your cake, freeze it down, and try and ice it still a little bit frozen. Because if your cake is ever so cold, working with it at room temperature, you're gonna get those beads of sweat 
and they could turn into puddles, which in turn will melt the inside of your sugar paste. So ideally, this needs to be pretty much at room temperature before you ice it. Okay, you can do all this, just make sure it's fully defrosted. And if I was preparing my cake to crumb coat stage and freezing it down, when I take it out, I'd keep it in the bag, let it defrost overnight, and then in the morning it should be fine to ice, just after I've hot knifed it to make it sticky. So that's the top surface, and I'm just filling with my finger, and there is sticky resistance compared to the side, okay? And then we can go ahead and do the sides nice and flat on the surface and just run the whole flat blade around the side and try and be systematic with it you'll know because it won't feel sticky sometimes it feels a bit shiny sorry looks a bit shiny if all else fails and this is not working for you because the cake is so cool and each time you hot knife it sets or you've had to walk away and you've left it in between uh, hot knifing and icing because you want to do the icing almost immediately after you've hot knifed it um, otherwise it ends up the buttercream ends up drying you can always go back and hot knife again okay ideally you, you don't want to do that because it's time consuming okay so just running the knife all the way around so when your cakes come out of the fridge this will be the first thing you do and then everything beyond that just watch the demo but don't try and remember it all it will come clear and i'll remind you of the steps as we go okay so i'm just doing a final wipe round. i've got a bit of excess here that i don't want so i'm just going to take that off don't want that in our buttercream in our sugar paste right there's one section here that doesn't feel like i've touched it yet so we'll do it and um, i think i was I had started to say if you cannot get it tacky in this way then you can leave your knife a little bit wet but not wet wet okay so that will bring some moisture onto the cake without making puddles so just feel round one more spread and I think I'm there, the top's okay. All right. And if you feel like you've got extra raised parts that you didn't have before, just get rid of those now. It's time to be fussy. Okay. So once you've hot knifed it, this can go on the side. It just feels like it's not. That's better. So I'm just going to move my cup out of the way. Be careful if you're putting too many knives in that cup because mine has a habit of toppling over. So my cake's going to get moved. And what I want to do now is actually show you how to prepare the icing. Now, there's lots of different varieties of sugar paste. And I would say buy what you can get, try it out, taste it. If it's not if it's not comfortable to work with then you move on and try something else the one I'm using today is Squire's sugar paste um, from Squire's kitchen okay and the only reason I've got that is because it was cheaper than anything else and it was what I could get at the time um, but it is quite nice paste some of the more professional paste now have got gum in it so that would mean that you could potentially um, roll the paste thinner than we're going to okay but you'll get to learn that as you go along so i have put some color in here mostly so that you can see me because white on white is not so easy to view i'm feeling like i think my um camera is not sure what to focus on so if you keep seeing my face it's just me resetting the camera okay when this comes out of the packet it does describe it as ready to roll it is not ready to roll that's what it looks like the block of paste 
If you just simply get a rolling pin to that, you're going to have no end of difficulty. It's going to cause cracks, pleats, creases, tears, everything, because the ingredients have not been warmed up enough and combined. In here, you've got fat, um, icing sugar, other ingredients, but you want to make sure it's all fully combined. So the quantity we're going to use to cover our cake is about 500 grams if you're not covering the board. And I like to split the two batches of paste in half so that I can comfortably warm them up in my hands. If you've got big hands, then that's fine. You can do it as one, uh, one piece. Or if you like to press hard, then use it, just warm up as one whole piece. And we're just going to turn this. So it's a press and turn. I'll do that slow. Do it the other way, press and turn. So if you're right-handed, you're probably going to want to press with your left hand. Press and turn. And I'll, when you come to do this, I can remind you. So press and turn. Okay. If you've got colour and it's not combined, the quickest way to combine the colour is by twisting. What you don't want to do is flatten and fold because it will dry out. So what I mean by that is if you're really heavy armed and you press it and you've got yourself a big flat piece of paste and then you do that with it to go again, you've incorporated all that air into the paste. And when you start to roll the paste out, you'll start to see surface air bubbles. And those air bubbles, when you peel them, you'll, they will reveal more um, sugar paste underneath. But the problem with that is that it kind of turns into puff pastry. And if you've rolled your paste thin enough um, and you're ready to put it on the cake and you've got an air bubble, when you peel it off, you've then got an indent, okay? So you need to avoid adding air. So once, I'll just give this a quick combine, it just um, shows you how the color comes through as well. This was just an ice blue, but you know, I do tend to color my paste rather than buy it if it's a light colour, but I would buy my paste colour if it was red or black or brown because it's so much easier. So we'll get those two pieces together now and we can start to warm up as a whole piece. So press and turn, but when I'm pressing, I'm only pressing to halfway. So you keep it as a block. If you quite like to press hard, and you're, you can't get away from having a flat piece of paste, then the best thing to do is have both hands together. You sit both hands on the, on the clump of paste, and as you press and your two thumbs come together, that's gonna to stop you from being able to press down any further. So you can warm up two-handed if you find that easier to control. So you absolutely don't want to add air. And the time you need to warm up is a lot longer than you think. You can't really over knead sugar paste. Um, it might on a hot day feel super soft because of the fat in it or if you've got hot hands. And it is okay if it starts to come off on your hands, on your palm while you're warming up. I never put icing sugar down when I'm warming up my paste. Just You just try and um, do it without putting anything, adding anything to it. And then just when you're ready and you've warmed it up, you can um, give your hands a wash before you start rolling out. So if you notice what I'm doing now, I've got myself into a little bit of a routine over the years. I press, rock back, press down and turn. So that's how I've ended up doing it. It's almost in like a circle rocking back. Now there is a fold, but it's like a pinch and a scooch. Um, but to start with, maybe just do the press and turn. It's going to make it easier. There's lots of different ways of warming up. The key is no air and for a long enough time. What you should end up with is something that looks really nice and smooth. Instead of, if I show you this one, we tried to warm this, just roll this out now, that it's not even, there's no way that that is ready to roll out, okay? So if it doesn't feel soft and smooth, it's not ready. I've just got to clean my hands now, so they're stuck. So I'm gonna show you the rolling out and to get it onto the cake.
How much are we using, Hannah? I'm using about 500 grams, but if you've got 750, I would use the whole lot because it doesn't matter if you have too much, but it will matter if there's not enough. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, if you notice fluff, take it out at this stage because it is a bit of a fluff magnet, I have to say. I've got, um, you don't need these, but if you have got them, these are the spacer bars. I'm gonna use those as training wheels today. And what they will do is allow me to rest the rolling pin as I'm rolling on them, which means that you can be assured that you're gonna at least get a piece of paste that is actually half a centimeter thick. And then we have to come off the training wheels um, towards the end to get it down to a four millimeter thickness, which is the thickness that I normally use to cover a cake. If you have one of the more professional sugar paste that's got gum in it, and it'll tell you on the back if it has in the ingredients section, then you can roll it thinner. Uh, you can roll it to three mil or sometimes two mil. But you run the risk of the top edge of the cake tearing if you roll it too thin, and you run the risk of the top edge stretching and showing you stretch marks if you roll it too thick. If you don't warm it up enough, that happens as well. Lots of do's and don'ts, but again, I'll remind you. So liberal with the icing sugar, because it's coming through a fine mesh, um, it doesn't matter how much you put on here because that's gonna be the underside of my paste. And I've got a bottom, so the bottom's gonna be face down on there and there it's not gonna be flipped over at all. I'm gonna use just the top. Take a little bit of icing sugar and roll, put that on the rolling pin so it doesn't stick and then start to roll. So to start with, I don't need to worry too much about resting the rolling pin on here because it's not gonna get thinner than the spaces. Roll up and down. Now I'm going to turn it a pizza wedge slice. So 10 a 10 minute turn each time on a clock, 12 o'clock, 10 o'clock, okay? To keep it as a circle, up and down. Now if you're very heavy handed with your roll, you're going to end up with a non shape very quickly. And if that happens, you need to actually turn it a 90 degree angle just to write it so it becomes a circle. We need something that's round for a round cake. If you're trying to do a square cake, trying to ice a square cake, then instead of turning it 10 minutes each time, you would turn it 90 degrees. So you'd start, roll up, down, and then you turn it quarter of an hour and that if you keep turning each time you'll get a square so up and down now you'll notice as I'm lifting my rolling pin I just want to demonstrate this because sometimes you can get lumps of icing sugar or something else that might be on your surface on your rolling pin so before you do each roll make sure your rolling pin is clean when you're rolling avoid stopping if i do this but i'm not on the spaces you get a ripple okay and you've got to avoid that because otherwise that's going to transfer onto your cake if you're at the point where it's nearly um, ready to cover so try and find a way of running the rolling pin so i like to hold on to the rolling pin and roll with one hand like so come back as well I'll just turn this and I'll show you a couple of other ways. Make sure it's not stuck as well. You want to um, check it every few rolls to make sure that you can still move it. If you think it's going to stick, then if you pour some extra icing sugar onto the surface of the board and then take your lift without thumbs, just lift underneath, take the excess icing sugar and get that under, scooch it under. Every now and again, rub your paste that will stop the surface from drying. So a couple of other ways, you can start here and you can walk. That would be another way, but you wanna make it flow so you're not getting ridges. Or some people like to use both hands and then transfer onto the arm as they come to the end. All the while you're on the spaces, that's easy enough. But when we have to come off the spaces, you then need to be mindful about falling off the edge as well. 
let your rolling pin, especially if you've got a marble one or a plastic one, do the work with the weight. You don't have to really press hard, let the rolling pin do the work. So now I can't get any bigger um, because the spaces are in the way. I need to take these out. This gives me half a centimetre, which actually is too thick. If I try to ice the cake um, now, as that goes over the top edge, it's going to stretch because there's so much uh, icing underneath. It won't know what to do and it'll just stretch and possibly tear. So we do need to make this a little bit softer, a little bit larger, sorry, a little bit thinner. So clean off your rolling pin, start at the bottom edge and kind of press and roll as you go, come back. Don't fall off the edge because you don't want to thin the edge. Turn it. Little rub, clean your rolling pin, go again. So what I'm trying to do now is just get it just a little bit thinner than it was. One thing that's very tempting is if you think you haven't got enough paste, you just keep rolling and getting it thinner and thinner. But if you go too thin, as you place this onto the cake and start to kind of cake with it, you will find that it could tear round the top edge again because your paste is too thin. So you want that four mil is the key. You can just get a ruler to it. Okay, so now we've got paste that is four mil all the way round. Okay. So just rub it with my fingers, uh, with my palm. I've just got this part of my hand on there. Fingers are lifted up. And I'm just getting the excess icing sugar. You can feel it all gritty and then it smooths. And that just, again, helps the surface not dry. So once you've polished it, we're ready to transfer um, the paste onto our cake. So you bring your cake in. My rolling pin is going to be balanced at the far end. It's not going to rest on the paste, it's going to be lifted up. My other hand, I've taken all my watches and rings off. Scoop underneath with a flat palm, flick it over, bring the cake in and then take hold of the rolling pin and line it up if I turn this the other way you'll see what I mean line it up with the edge of the cake okay and then immediately transfer the problem is if you suspend it too long the sugar paste is quite stretchy so you could end up thinning it too much okay so it's an immediate line up with the base of the cake and then okay so the first thing I've done is actually just smooth it a little bit just to make sure it's stuck and I've used this part of my hand just to go around the top edge. Again, I will remind you of all of this as you go. So here I've got a lot of excess. And to help me a little bit, I don't want to have this. I've just realized I'm going to use the back of my, um, I've, my palette knives are all buttercreamy at the moment. So I'm just going to use the back of my uh, serrated knife to get that off. Just watch your surfaces. Okay, because that could drag. Now, we need to get rid of all these pleats and that's one of the key things that um, people have trouble with. So I normally tackle the worst pleat first and the worst piece is always going to be on the back. I always work on the back of the cake. Okay, so with one hand, whichever is more comfortable, lift the weight of the paste. With the other hand, using this part of your hand, you're going to scoop up. So as I'm working on the cake, I'm pressing onto the cake and I'm scooping up. So I'm sticking on, scoop up, stick on, scoop up, stick on, scoop up, on, scoop up. Until you get a little bit down to the bottom, you won't be able to get all the way. But the idea of the pressing on and scooping up is that you are shrinking your paste rather than doing this to get it on, which is going to stretch it and increase the size of your pleats. So kind of cup it onto the cake, scooping it up. And each time, turn the cake around, straighten up the pleat so it's open, support the weight. If you don't support the weight and you try and do this, you could end up tearing it here. This is your key bit, which normally goes wrong. So on with the hand and scoop up. So you're kind of stroking the cake upwards. And this is how 
I do it, how I get rid of all the plate pleats. Some there are online tutorials, you look at them and they just go like this and it's done. This is how I get rid of those pleats. Tackle them head on as well. Don't shift the pleats out of the way. You know, think, oh, I'll deal with that later and move it over. You need to actually open up, flare the pleat and then press on, working from the top edge of the cape down. You won't get all the way to the bottom at this stage. So now I've got one big one here, so I'm just going to open that out. And again, working on about this section size at a time, scoop that on. Now, it's flaring a little bit, and the reason for that is because in the time it's taken me to talk and demo, my buttercream has dried out a fraction. But it will stick, so I just need to make sure that those sides are on. Everything I do is not with my fingers, it's more with flat parts of my hand as well, because if I keep doing this, I'm going to end up with finger ridges all the way around. I don't want to do that. Okay, so I'm going to use a smoother now. A little bit of icing sugar on there so it doesn't stick, and we're going to drop this onto the top. And just with a little bit of pressure, so this is very feather light now, everything I'm doing is feather light. Just press that down a little bit and run it in a circle motion so that you have got a flat top. When your top is flat, you don't need to go back to it. That's it, don't fiddle, that's it. This part of my hand here is gonna sit onto the bevel edge and we're gonna run round. You can do it with the other hand as well, just to neaten. So if I have bumpy edge, then I can use that motion to flatten and make that look neat. So that's my top, so flat top. This is all fine, and now we work on the side. So on my tool, I've actually got, and it doesn't matter if you haven't got this, but I've got a straight edge, and on the other side, I've got a curvy edge. We have the curvy edge, if you've got one, down for this next process straight edge is uppermost and that's just going to go onto the side of the cake and we're going to come down again you might not be able to go all the way to the bottom at this stage but you're pressing in so pressing in and smoothing so it's a side to side motion just find the side that works for you so because i'm left-handed i like to be on the left side of this this will make sure that the paste attaches itself to the cake. Okay. At this stage as well, because I'm not covering the board at the same time, I can trim within an inch. I'm just using the back side of my um, serrated bread knife to get the those trimmings off but I usually use a palette knife mine are a bit buttery so this leftover paste we can squidge up into a nice warmed up ball and we can reuse that either for your next cake or you can make characters out of it and turn it into modeling paste okay this is still a little bit loose so I need to tell it what to do here so I need to apply a bit more pressure because if your sides aren't stuck if you start trimming you're going to expose cake. You're going to trim the wrong thing. Okay. So, once having used the curvy edge down most, you can then turn your smoother so that you've got the sharp edge, if you've got one, down. And what that's going to do is you're going to press into the cake. Also, you're going to press down onto the excess paste. And as you do that, it's going to give you a little guideline to cut. Just push the paste into the cake a little bit while you do this to help it. So going all the way around with the sharper end of the tool, if you've got it. Um, and that will give you a 90 degree angle. So I'm not just pushing in, I'm pushing down as well. Okay. Some people like to kind of chop into it like this, which is fine if that works. I'll just try and show you what I mean. Okay, so now we've got 
a bit of a, a 90 degree angle going on there. Now I have got another tool I wanted to show you, which is a smedger. Um, smoother, edger, smedger. Okay, it's a very old tool, but you can get them. Squires Kitchen sell them. If you're local to me, I've got a couple that I can sell you. But this particular tool is um, really useful for pushing the paste onto the side of the cake and getting your 90 degree angle, especially if you decide you want to cover the board at the same time. Because it's flat on the bottom, it doesn't damage the paste that's on the surface of the board. So that is another tool that you can use. I use it quite a lot, but it is more specialist than the other one. If you're gonna invest in one first, it's the, it's the one I've just shown you. Okay. So that will do the 90 degree angle as well. So the last bit before I let you loose is for you to trim your cake. Okay, so I've just got to, this knife has been in my water, so I just need to make sure that that is clean and dry. And for this, it's actually easier if I sit down, so I'm just going to plonk myself. There we go. So trimming the cake, you want to make sure that you've definitely got this pushed on. Draw the knife down the vertical side of the cake, come to the bottom where you've made that 90 degree angle line, and then bring the blade of the knife slightly away at the top. And the reason for that is because you don't want to create a double line. Okay, and then you start to trim. So we push in, draw the blade down to the marking that you've made and cut. And it's done in small trims. Now, the people do like to use uh, things like a pizza wheel. I can't get on with them. I catch the knuckle and, and then I'm, I'm back to square one. I can only do it this way for some reason. So you can then pull the excess off. You can go all the way around if you want first. And then these pieces that are left, you just go back on with the knife, making sure the top edge of the blade is away from the cake. So you don't get that double line and you can give yourself a neat cut. Now, when you're doing all of this, the silver boards especially have a habit of scoring very easily. So when you trim like this, you don't want to hack into the board because if your board is going to be part of the display, it's going to show, you'll have scratch marks and they're going to show. Okay, so I'm just going all the way around, pushing on initially to make sure that I have got this close enough to the cake. If you don't do that bit, as you start trimming, you'll realise you're going wrong because you'll start to see cake at the bottom. If that happens, don't worry too much because there is a ribbon to go on. But I'm not going to show you the ribbon uh, for a while. I'll let you crack on with your icing of your cake first. Okay, so I'm just going to do the last bit here, pressing on to make sure it's adhered, following that line, and then going back round to meet. You should, once you've got into a habit with this, Get it so nice that you don't actually need to put a ribbon on it. Okay. Okay, so um, when you've rolled your paste out, to check if the paste is big enough to cover the cake, you can actually measure your cake side across the top and down to the bottom of the other side. And that length there should fit within your paste. So Mary Claire, if you want to, you can check that. You can use a piece of cotton. Yeah. Um, so this is the last bit now, which is actually showing you how to put the ribbon around the cake, which is quite straightforward, but there might be a couple of things that you'll pick up from this. So I've got double-sided sticky tape, which is at least um, the width of the ribbon. You can go thinner, but obviously you don't want to be thicker than that. So just make sure that it is um, about the same thickness as the ribbon. Okay. I'm just going to measure 
we're just going to put some ribbon around the cake today. If you were doing the board as well, then you'd need to put double-sided sticky tape all the way around the board edge. I don't use trip stick, I only use double-sided tape. So we're just going to measure out the, the length of um, uh, ribbon that we need so that there is an overlap of about an inch. Okay, an overlap. Now this hasn't got a right or wrong way, but often it curls one way. So if it's curling, make the inside the curl inward, if that makes sense, just so it's not resisting you. Okay, so it's about an inch overlaps. Where it overlaps here, I'm going to just put a strip of just an inch of double-sided tape. So this is going to go on the bit that's going to overlap. And the reason I do that, I want it to overlap because I want a neat finish, but I put the tape on before I trim it. I've made a bit of a mess with that, so let's do it again. I put the tape on before I trim it because the tape will help it not fray. Okay, just try and keep the tape straight as you do it, otherwise it'll distort the shape. So that's the overlapped bit with the double-sided tape on it. Go back and double check where it's overlapping so you can visualize where you want your cut. So on the overlap, I'm gonna put my cut about here at an angle. So just take your scissors and cut. It can either be this way or that way, but you simply, you, you just wanna chop it so it's definitely overlapping the piece that's gonna be underneath so you don't reveal cake. So now we've got a little angle to our um, piece here. Peel off the tape backing. That's actually one of the hardest things, I think. And then we need to position it nice and tightly around the base of the cake. And then just take a moment or two to bring the two pieces together to overlap. Now the thing, the important thing here is that it is tight, but bearing in mind that your cake is still soft, you don't want to press in to the cake. So if that's gonna happen, you might wanna leave the ribbon for a couple of hours until it's dry. Now what I wanted to do is show you a bow. I'm just gonna change color because I appreciate that the white doesn't show very well. So I've got some blue here. Going to cut a four, roughly a four inch length strip. And then I'm going to cut a second piece that's only maybe an inch wide. And that piece is just going to be big enough so it overlaps and can be turned under. I'm also, for a moment, those who get motion sick don't look, I'm just going to bring my camera a bit closer with focus so that you can see me better. Okay, that's it. So, Take another strip of your tape and pop that into the centre. Peel off the backing and bring one end of the ribbon to the centre of the tape that's in the middle and the other end to meet it. And give the two curvy ends a press. You can leave it more rounded if you want. Where that's joined, take another little piece of tape, this time only a small bit. Pop that into there in the middle where that join is. Peel off the backing. Press quite firm between your finger and thumb and then when you come to a corner it should pull back easily harder on the cake than it is on ribbon. Take your small piece, turn your ribbon over so that you've got the clean side, the neat side, and position it in the center. Turn it over and then flip over the ends. Press quite firm so that they stick onto the tape. Now we need a little piece extra to go in the middle here so that when I stick this ribbon onto the cake, it will hold. So again, another little piece of tape across the center that will hold your stuck ends in place as well. 
curl up to reveal the double sided tape. And that's ready to stick on. So you've got a really nice, neat little ribbon. And that, if you want to, can go over the join. But often when I'm putting my ribbon on a cake, that join would be at the back of the cake. There's always a front and a back. But if it is going to be where your front is, then you can just bring, you can, you can stick this anywhere, but you can put it on this join to disguise it. So just hold that, just give it a little press. Now the beauty of this is, if your cake's not too damp, once it's dry, once the cake's a little bit dry, this will move. So you can decide where you want that bow. So if you end up making a dink and you want that bow showing at the front of the cake, then you can just move it to where you want it to be. And that's your finished iced cake with a bow. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to get in touch. My email address is hannah at inspiredcreations.com. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.